I've got a question to pose to all of you. How's morale in your workplace today? And as employees, do you feel as though you're thriving at work? Our friends at Gallup tell us that there's still more work to do to create a thriving workforce. According to Gallup's Global Workplace Report, a total of 7 in 10 employees are struggling in their overall lives rather than thriving, which begs the question, what can employers do to reverse the trend? Prioritizing the well-being of people is no longer considered a nice-to-have goal, but a significant differentiating factor when evaluating great places to work and assessing high-performing organizations and leaders. For Kate Ekman, she's a life coach, motivational speaker, and best-selling author who helps leaders and organizational decision-makers empower themselves to win at every stage of life. Ekman wants to help leaders with their full spirit workout to make sure that they show up as present in every aspect of their leadership journey in their life. She is the author of The Full Spirit Workout, a 10-step system to shred self-doubt, strengthen your spiritual care, and create a fun and fulfilling life. Ekman is also a broadcast journalist and TV personality who brings her expertise in communications, mindfulness, and performance as a success coach. At the end of the day, Ekman's main goal is to create thriving people, and she joined me this week to give me the winning recipe and ingredients to get that very job done. I'm Kevin McShane. Let's have this conversation. to talk to you this afternoon all about leadership and overcoming obstacles. Great to see you uh, this afternoon, and thanks so very much for being here on this rainy uh, winter Tuesday. It's raining here, so thank you so very much for being here. Kevin, thank you so much for having me. It's my joy to be here with you. Absolutely. Now, can you always, you, you tell me that, you know, when we talk about confidence and anxiety you are telling me it's part of the human experience and uh, as people and as a society at one point or another we all struggle with that in our lives so can you tell me about that and why it's important for you to help get a, people their confidence back yeah i think we we've been sold a bill of goods in our culture and there's this notion that we all just need to put on a happy face and and be grateful and positive all the time and while i i certainly you know promote and like happy faces and and gratitude um we are human beings we are we're not robots or blow up dolls and life as we all know can be quite challenging there's trials there's tribulations there's trauma there's global pandemics there's there's death of loved ones there's loss of job there's so many things that we all experience and and you know you certainly have experienced um some some personal setbacks and people experience financial setbacks there's so many things that i won't bore people with because we've all been there but 
Um, I, I think that the quicker that we can embrace um, the full spectrum of human emotions and and what it means to to be a human. And, and some days we have sad moments and we experience anger and frustrations and all the things. Um, and what a gift that is because our emotions are our data and our emotions um, help us uncover what matters to us and what our value, you know, maybe you're angry because your, your boundaries haven't been respected or your values are being compromised. And so I think when we can look at why we're feeling a certain way, get really comfortable with our feelings and emotions, make friends with them and learn from them and stop judging ourselves and other people, then we can really get a handle on them. And then uh, we more frequently uh, get to put on that genuine happy face and, and be in a state of gratitude because we have that self-awareness and and we've um embraced who we truly are yeah absolutely and uh, you know okay uh, one of the reasons i wanted to talk to you today is i wanted to uh, get your perspective on the power of self-reflection you know you brought up covid and all the things that we went through uh, during that time period and in some cases some people are still going through it but i'm curious to ask you about the power of you know, self-reflection and uh, the power of sort of reinventing ourselves. Because I think one, one silver lining that came out of COVID was the uh, the importance of really realigning priorities in life, life and making uh, people self-reflect. Would you agree with that? Yeah, during COVID, I came up with a practice that I call my sit and stare practice. And I do it at least five minutes a day, usually a lot longer. But I, I found myself, you know, in the beginning of the lockdown, certainly where I would just stare out the window and and think, what what is going on? I mean, it was just such unprecedented. And I, I, I lived alone and I was in New York City and it was just it was it was traumatizing. And it was something that we all experienced as a collective. And so I started getting more intentional with that staring out the window. And I would check in with myself as if I were a small child. And I would say, how are you doing today? What's working? What isn't? What do you need? Do you need support here? Do you need to talk to someone? One. And it came became a really powerful practice because I was in self reflection and I was able to um, meet my own needs. And I think we all just rush from one thing to the next, or we we numb and self medicate with food, drugs, alcohol, sex, you know, television. What what online shopping? I love online shopping. Or I'm getting away from that, but. I think not numbing out and instead just really um, facing the music, if you will, and, and really getting comfortable with um, what's going on within us. And then what's great about that is you're able to then make more powerful choices, make more deliberate, conscious, intentional choices that get you closer to your goals and dreams rather than distract you or, or take you away. So I think maybe it's with your, your morning coffee. I forgot to drink my coffee, so I'm, I'm having some now, but I do like to stare out into nature and, and just really reflect and process. I think this is something great to do in between all the, the meetings in person or the Zoom meetings. Take that pause, you know, ask yourself what was great about that meeting, what worked, what's the takeaway, what's the next action step. Otherwise, we get so bombarded and overwhelmed. I think we all need to be a bit kinder to ourselves and 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 treat ourselves more like like you know the little kid that we have within rather than overdoing it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the ways that you connect with people, I know that you created as something you call a full spirit workout, uh, which works out our spirit because you know, like you you say, going to the gym, you don't get a six pack by working out once and just letting your body tag over it takes more work so it also takes work on your spirit so i'm wondering if you can tell me about the full spirit workout and what it's all about yeah so the full spirit workout is my book it's a play on the full body workout that you often hear advertised at the gym it's about bringing your full spirit to everyone you meet and to everything that you do so it's showing up like you mean it we all have to work our physical muscles at the gym or, or outside at the track to combat against gravity but much less emphasis is placed on our mental and emotional and spiritual muscles that have to combat emotional gravity like stress anxiety 
fear, depression, global pandemics, whatever is going on in, in our crazy chaotic world. And so it's building that inner musculature that can weather any storm and building that self-confidence that can't be taken out by a bad day or a job loss or, or anything like that in the outside world. So really it's fine tuning your instrument before you can play it for the world. And, um, you know, it's like going to the gym. It only works if you do. You can't just show up in your cute outfit and expect your personal trainer to do all the sit-ups and pull-ups for you. But then the results are yours. And, and you'll notice just like going to the gym, you'll start to get those endorphins boosting through your veins and you'll start to get that runner's high and you'll want to keep keep going because you'll see the increased performance. You'll see heightened creativity. You'll see your relationships improved. And you'll see that you just are starting to become the person who doesn't have to strive or force or control anything or anyone. You just naturally attract the opportunities, the experiences, and the people that will help you and assist you to reach your actualized full potential. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Ken, I know that we're both a motivational speakers. And you know, one of the messages that I always tell people is that we're all we're all in life, given a life compass, and it, it's incumbent upon all of us to sort of point our life compass in the direction that we want to go. And you know, we're all given, in my judgment, a deck of cards, and it, we all have to stack it in our favor as best we can. So, talk to me about <clears throat> taking a sort of personal ownership of your own uh, life des destiny and how important it is for you to have a personal level of expectations because you can't reach anybody else's unless you have some of your own, right? Yeah, I think that the, the, the best part about taking 100% 100 responsibility for our own lives is that then we have the power to change them. We're not shaming or blaming other people. We're not expecting other people to do it for us. I, I recently had a woman who was, in my opinion, trying to use me to, to use my contacts and to use things to get what she wanted. And I thought, why don't you just, you know, hold yourself accountable and, and like, why don't you open, open your own doors? And I, I think once you've reached a certain level of relationship with, with a friend or a client, certainly you can help them. But I, I'm finding nowadays, a lot of people want a handout. They want you to do the work for them and that doesn't teach them anything. And then you may get the opportunity, but then you probably won't be able to keep it or sustain it. So there, there is something so powerful about us taking responsibility because then we are in, in such a powerful position where we can change things, we can acquire things, we can um, make a difference rather than waiting, hoping, wishing for someone else to, to hold our hand and do it for us. Yeah, and, and there's a value to authentic human connection because, you know, one of the things I always say is, Life is a constant game of networking, isn't it? Yeah, I, I think I think that we can network, um, you know, with with the powers that be too. I spend a lot of time just when I'm in my sit and stare. I think networking with with God, spirit, angels, if you have that belief system and I think it's so important to focus on what we can give rather than what we can get. There's this culture that I'm seeing now, and it's dependent, I think, on certain age groups, but um you know, I, I I think when you are a place of here are my strengths, here are my gifts and getting really clear on what those are and what you can offer and where and how you can add value. That's networking, showing up and expecting, hey, Kevin, you're a speaker. Can you hook me up with your agent? Or I want to speak at this school. Can you hook me up or make a phone call? I think you're doing yourself a disservice and, and you're, you're probably repelling a lot of opportunities and people by showing up in that space. So I invite everyone who's listening to, to really take stock of your unique gifts and strengths you know, write them down, think about it, have them ready to go. So when you show up at these events, you can, and people ask you, you know, or you have an answer or you have something of value add rather than being in a position of wanting to take. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, you know, one of the ways you drew that is through your five P's of confidence and working with people to develop that. So can you tell me about the five P's of confidence and why they're so important? Yeah, so I, I, I developed these during, but while writing my thesis at Columbia, getting my master's in executive and organizational coaching and, and really leveraging confidence to accelerate leadership development. And I think, um, you know, people think, well, I'm good at my job, so I'm confident. But what, what I experienced with a lot of leaders and professional athletes and other people I worked with is that 
um, everyone's lacking in confidence in some area. Maybe they're confident as their job and, and accounting, but they lack confidence in difficult, uncomfortable communication or conversations, for example. Or you talk to some of the greatest athletes of all time, they have moments where they don't feel confident at the free throw line or under a great amount of pressure the last play of the game. So it's an inside job. And, and the five Ps are... Uh, presence. So it's it's being present and showing up like you mean it with that great presence. It's patience, um, purpose, having a strong why, preparation, and practice. And because I love you and your audience, I'll give you two bonus P's. And that is pause and person, as in be a person. So with pause, you're going to pause uh, before you respond to the upsetting email and perhaps ruin the relationship forever. You're going to pause before you tell the jerk they're really being a, a jerk, right? You're going to take that moment. And person, you know, my speaking coach, Eduardo Placer, used to say to me uh, as someone who, um, you know, struggles with perfectionism and obsession with with performance and, and, and being perfect at all times in that arena, he said, just be a freaking person. So this is a reminder to and embrace your humanity and, and just be a freaking person. People love your humanity. People love your authenticity. People love your vulnerability. There's no such thing as perfection. And, and I think now people don't want any, any pretending. They want to see the person in you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'm still working on the patience and, and making sure that everything not it doesn't always have to be perfect. It's still a work in progress for me, okay? Well, patience stems from the words to 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 suffer. And so that's why, you know, we're all suffering while we're waiting for the thing that we want. But I think if you can look on it, like lean into your faith, um, hold on loosely, as a 38 special song says, I think sometimes we, we, you know, it's like the motorcycle, we're gripping so tight to hold on, that we actually repel our goals. So the more that you can, you know, take your action steps, put in the work, and then take a step back, pause, you know, exercise another P, a bonus P, and 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 really, you know, let things happen behind the scenes. Let the universe work its magic. Have some space for allowing and receiving and trusting, you know, while you're doing your work. But um, I promise you, the, the thing that you want, the opportunity that you want, is able to come in faster when you're not blocking it with your impatience. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, what are one of the reasons. I find your work uh, fa fascinating. And do you talk about not getting outside of our self-worth and ourselves in terms of, of getting off the hamster wheel of expectations in life? So how can we make sure that we make our self-worth a priority and not get outside of ourselves? Yeah, I, I think we're all, you know, listen, I had an on-camera career in New York City, so it was the constant rat race. I guess I was more of a rat than a hamster, and even though the rats in New York City are disgusting, but it's that constant striving for perfection and achievement and accomplishment. And I get it. It costs a gazillion dollars to live there. Um, and so I think, though, you know, I lost two loved ones to suicide in, in one year, and it made me step off the hamster wheel and really closely examine the way I was choosing to live my own life, which like many people and, and like these men that I lost was someone who placed a lot of emphasis in the externals, you know, what we look like, how much money we're making, how many people we're impressing, the car, the house, the clothes, all of it. And I think being able to go within, cultivate these inner characteristics like kindness, compassion, empathy, intelligence, and and leading with that and, and, and having the focus be, what can I give again, rather than what I can get and, and really taking stock of, of how we're choosing to live our lives and, and taking a moment to discover who we are, who we truly want to be, and what we really want. Not what we want in terms of society, parents, neighbors, what's expected of us, the script we're given at birth, but what we really want. And that takes some time to sit down and, and reflect because we are bombarded with so much messaging that tells us what we should be doing. It hasn't even occurred to so many of us what we actually want to be doing and who we actually have to become to do or be or have that thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Kate, as I shared with you before we started our conversation this afternoon, I was born with what's called uh, spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Uh, simply means that I, I don't have enough oxygen in my legs to walk normally. And, you know, outside of hosting this podcast, you know, 
I work with businesses and organizations to create a, a sort of a inclusive culture for folks with disabilities to be infused in today's workforce. So I'm curious to ask you about the concept of inclusion and acceptance for all people, particularly those with disabilities. How do you think we can better infuse the idea of acceptance for all people in today's society? I think when leaders and decision makers and policymakers in particular start to really accept all parts of themselves and, and the parts of them that are maybe emotionally disabled or mentally disabled or, um, you know, their own limitations that they, they haven't dared to look into, you were forced. To look into it because you couldn't walk, for instance. And so you were forced to do the work and, and bravo to you. And thank you for showing up every day and doing the work and not being bitter and, and not, um, you know, having a victim mentality. You're a victor and you're out there doing the work and, and making things better for everybody. So thank you so much. It's a testament to your character. So I think more people should hire you and 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 ask you and learn from you how you did it because you've overcome something that that many or even most of us have not had have, have to overcome that's in your face every day literally so thank you so much it's it's really an honor to to know you and and to be in your presence of greatness but i think the sooner that people who are in a position of power to make these decisions um really look at themselves and and look at um, care about other people. You know, so many people, it's just about their bottom line or, you know, so many people and in, in America certainly have made money their God. And I think when, again, we go back to humanity and think about genuinely helping people, not because of what we can get from it or goodwill, or we may look cool or good, um, but really caring, but to do that, to care about you and people that are disabled and people who are not like us, we have to first care enough about ourselves deeper than, again, those externals. So it is a process. It's one of the reasons I wrote my book so we can all get fit on the inside and we can all develop this inner musculature. But I, I think it starts with people taking a closer look at themselves before they're even able to understand the plight of someone else and therefore help them. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, when we talk about leadership and rising to the level of leadership, as you know, lead, leaders are under an immense amount of pressure. They don't always have the necessary confidence they need to lead effectively. So how do you think leaders of organizations can overcome a lack of confidence in order to thrive in their position of leadership? I think first you have to be willing to admit that you lack confidence in certain areas. I don't see a lot of leaders having that kind of humility or self-awareness or um, willingness to stretch themselves and to maybe go to a dark place. We all have our shadow side. I think the more that people can um, really get clear on what's um, inhibiting their performance and really get clear on, you know, their their own their own perceived flaws or limitations and and where they don't always get it right then they can start to become more authentically powerful and confident but first you have to be willing to admit that you don't always have the answers that you're not always right that you do need help that you do need coaching or therapy or um a support system so once you have that awareness then you can take the steps to you know work with a thought partner then you can um take action towards um, becoming someone who has that inner confidence rather than the, the, the ego false confidence that's just ordering people around, disrespecting people, not taking, you know, diversity and inclusion seriously, um, not leading with, with true power, but with um, the, the ego power, like I said. And we see this again and again and, and play out. And it is going to take more of a revolution. And we're, it's going to take people who have done the work, people of color, women, people with disabilities, to, to promote them, more of them into these leadership roles. So there is more of a balancing of the scales, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And again, one of the things that I strongly believe is that there's strength in being vulnerable, but the strength in showing vulnerability. So I wanted to ask you about uh, emotional gravity and sort of com uh, combating emotional gravity and using emotions as a strength to lead. How important do you think that is? 
Well, I think it's important that we all get a grip on on our emotions, but also embracing, like I said earlier, the the full spectrum of of human emotions, but really um, to to lead with that, to lead with the passion, but, you know, the harnessed passion and to um, be willing to you know, admit that you, you don't have all the answers all the time and surround yourself with a team who they can fill in and have the answer here. They have a strength that, that maybe you don't have. And so, um, it takes a great deal of, of, of inner work and, and being willing to do that. But I think, um, when you are in a place of, of vulnerability, you are in a, a place of strength and, and power. And it's counterintuitive to what we've been told and to what our, our culture says and does. But I think the more that we can just be real about who we are and where we are and then get the necessary support, because then you inspire other people to do the work and get the support. Then you inspire people to be more real and genuine and, and, and powerful in their strengths and gifts, rather than everybody being these little robots um, that are kind of miserable. Cause people can sniff out, um, you know, like a lot of people, you know, everything is sales, really. If you think about it, people can sniff out when the salesperson is disingenuous, when the salesperson doesn't really care about the benefit of the product or service for you. They're just trying to make a sale. When, but when you come from a place of vulnerability, you are in a place of, of genuine, authentic connection. And, and that's how you are able to, to move the needle in, in business and, and in life. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just going back very quickly to expectations, you know, I'm a firm believer in that ex expectations can drive us to achieve for sure teams. But if you don't put in the work to fill sort of your own emotional cup, I, I, I think it's hard to show up for other people. So tell me about finding your inner, inner center as a leader and sort of reconnecting yourself and how important it is to fill sort of your own emotional cup so you can uh, show up for the people that you lead. Yeah, I mean, certainly. And I think one of my favorite ways to, to do that is to do what I call a walking meditation, ideally in nature, and, and just check in with yourself and you know, even as a leader, you maybe you're not even meant to be in that role, or maybe it's time to to step down, or maybe it's um, it's time to to hire the coach or something. So I think the more time that we can spend in self reflection, um, asking ourselves, you know, a question I love to ask myself: if you take away geography, money, what people think, any of that what do you really want to be doing? I think a lot of times even leaders find themselves in a role that they've outgrown or where they're, they're overwhelmed or underwhelmed. And I think there's so much um, power and integrity and, and knowing when it's time to leave the job, the party, the relationship, uh, whatever it is. And in terms of expectations, you know, someone said to me the other day, but, you know, especially when you have such high expectations of yourself, like, but we need to lower expectations for others. And, and I actually disagree with that. I think we, it's okay to hold people to very high standards, but give them the tools to do that. So you want your, your team to perform at a certain level, give them the tools to be able to do that rather than just expecting people. It's like expecting a five-year-old to compete in the NBA. He or she is not ready. And you know, you have to like, you know, trust and honor the process and the timing, but also give people the resources that will set them up for success to meet your expectations. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Ken, I'm also wondering your thoughts on dealing with the societal pressures of today and, you know, you know blocking out the noise of society, you know, Ken, I originally went to school to become a sports reporter, and I have a degree in journalism, so it doesn't give me any pleasure to say this, but when you turn on the news today, you're bombarded with, with everything that's wrong with the world today. So I'm curious about how do you think we can uh, sort of block out the noise and the chaos of society to, le to level up our game as leaders? I think it's spending more time in quiet reflection. Everyone hears about meditation and its benefits and its value, but you know, even myself, there's plenty of days that that I don't do it for whatever reason. So I think it's really prioritizing our our own well being and our own wellness and and putting into practice whether it's journaling, working with a coach, 
walking in nature, uh, um, the meditation, but it, it is a counterintuitive approach. It's spending more time in stillness rather than the hustle and grind and force and control and trying to manipulate people and situations. And uh, the more quiet time we can spend alone um, with the distractions and devices turned off, um, you know, philosopher Blaise Pascal, late great Blaise Pascal once said, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. I think it's so beautiful and brilliant and true. And, and I saw so many people struggle with this during COVID where they couldn't distract themselves with all the activities and all the things and were forced to sit at home with themselves. So as uncomfortable as it can be for some to, to sit in silence and, and really get up close and personal with yourself and, and check in. And there's, you know, I have plenty of ways to do that in my book. There's plenty of resources out there. You just have to prioritize it and it, it has to be important for you. And, and rather to you get to the place where it's kind of forced upon you because of, you know, where you are in your life. I think if we can have that proactive a- approach and really care for ourselves before we get get sick or get to a place where we're desperately in need of some tools, uh, the better. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I'm I'm fascinated to ask you um, my next to last question. And that is, what do you think is the difference between instant gratification and sustainable success? Mm, Wow, what a beautiful question. Um, That kind of, you know, reminds me of, of what I ask people what do you want versus what do you really want with really in italics? For instance, I want to eat the entire pizza. What I really want is optimal health and fitness and longevity. So I think if you can re- ask yourself what you really want, and in the case of eating pizza, for all my people who like eat uh, pizza and carbs and we numb by food and eating, um, it, it's getting a grip on why do I need to numb? What what is the discomfort I'm experiencing right now? And taking time to to unpack that, ideally with a a professional. Um, What are you really hungry for? It's not the sixth slice of pizza. So I, I think like the online shopping for me, that's my other way of numbing out. It's just do you really want or need this thing? And hey, I like nice things as much as the next person. But it's like, what is this really about? Because what I really want is to invest my money and and be able to purchase my dream home. And where I live, a starter home is $3 million, which is obnoxious. So, um, you know, I think it's just really, 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 really getting clear on what you really want. And you get clear on what you really want when you know who you are. So it takes some time. Um, But like I said, there's resources. Please check out my book, The Full Spirit Workout. I have it all outlined in there for you because you deserve to have the life of your dreams and, and manifest your desires. And I think when you get really clear on, on who you are and what you really want, um, you'll see that it's it's closer within your reach than than you even realize, and you can really you know get an action strategy to get there. And I, I'll be cheering you on um, all along the way. Absolutely, and yeah, I'm going to combine my next two questions because uh, uh, they're uh, sort of in, interconnected, and I think it's a good way to end our conversation today. I'm curious to ask you, what do you think are the keys to cultivating prosperity and when you look at your own life Kate how do you want your personal and professional legacy to be defined um so the first part to that was how we cultivate prosperity that's correct yeah yeah I think first you have to define what is prosperity because prosperity to you might mean a $10 $10 million mansion and prosperity to me might mean waking up with a peace of mind every day. So getting clear on, on what prosperity and abundance uh, means to you. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, really want to be wealthy and they they mean financial wealth. For me, if I want to feel super, super wealthy, um, I, I call a friend and, and go to lunch and connect with them. I feel so abundant when I'm deeply connecting with someone that I love. I feel so abundant when I'm in a place of beauty and, and nature and, and looking out. So abundance can mean a lot more than just a, a mansion and, and a Ferrari. So getting really clear on your definitions of what things are, because when you're clear about it, that's how you manifest it and call it in. And I believe the second part of your question, you'll have to refresh me. Yeah, I was just curious about your own life and your legacy. How do you want your personal and professional legacy to be defined? Oh, thank you for that. I 
I want my legacy to be, this is a woman who loved really hard and, and really deeply and really thoroughly and properly. And I felt so seen and heard and acknowledged in Kate's presence. And Kate helped me open my heart and, and deeply connect with myself and therefore others. And from that place, I was able to manifest and live my most authentic, fulfilling, meaningful life. Yeah, absolutely. And Kate, finally, tell me if people want to get connected with you or uh, buy your book, book, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, just head on over to thefullspiritworkout.com or Kate Ekman, K-A-T-E-E-C-K-M-A-N.tv. Happy to connect with you there and would love to be on this journey of self-discovery with you with the Full Spirit Workout. So thank you so much. And, and thank you so much to you, Kevin. You are a true delight and you are, you are kicking butt in the world. I just appreciate you so much. Well, I, I certainly appreciated the chance to engage in, in conversation with you and to be exposed to your endless amounts of energy and enthusiasm for life, Kate, your work in the space of personal and life development is most appreciated. And I want to thank you for being here this afternoon. It's most appreciated. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful day.